your Bibles are still open to Isaiah 65. Stay tuned, stay focused, stay attentive, stay in your place, and let God speak to your heart this morning as I'm preaching about smoke in God's nose. Smoke in the nose of God. The subtitle, God's Amazing Grace. Oh, it's an amazing thing. We, what a wonderful God we have. What a complex God we have. What a full God we have. And we find that in Isaiah 65. That's why I said this morning, you got to make sure you're back tonight to understand it all. But looking at smoke in God's nose. Smoke in the nose of God. This is a very unusual chapter. Let me give you a little insight for both how I prepare to preach and how you can prepare to receive the preaching. And I'm going to start including this thought in many of the messages just to remind us. Because when you look at a passage like this and you say, Preacher, what's, what's God trying to say? We have to understand and remember in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, it tells us what he's trying to say in all the Bible. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all Scripture, that includes Isaiah 65, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So with that in mind, God says chapter 65 of Isaiah is there first of all for doctrine. Doctrine, truth, good teaching, good instruction, knowledge. You ought to walk away from Isaiah 65 knowing something more about God, gleaning something more about God and His will. So there's doctrine, teaching. But if that's all we got out of it, we miss the purpose of all Scripture. Then it says reproof. The word reproof there means evidence to rebuke. In other words, there's something there that gives us evidence on why I need to be rebuked, something that God says, whoa, this is something you need to check your heart about and to do. So we look at Isaiah 65, we get some teaching, we get some re re reproof, some evidence. Then correction, that word very basically means to straighten up again. Ladies, you did some correction this week, no doubt, in your house. You went in the kitchen, you looked around and says, well, I need to do some correction around here. Or you may have looked at your husband and said, husband, you need some correction. Uh, you need to straighten up in this area. That's all it means is straighten it up. Again, putting it back in place. It doesn't even talk about the original. It talks about refixing where we were. So we look at this passage. We need to, for God's people to be fixed, to be corrected again, to be straightened up again. And then instruction. The word instruction means a tutoring or a training. In other words, we're going to learn what's right and how to go about doing it, all right? Instruction in righteousness. We need to be taught that. So we need to be some training in there. And lastly, to get to work. That's what it says. Per thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we're looking at being taught. We're looking about being reproved, straightened up, instructed, and get to work. So when we look at Isaiah 65 in any passage, when I prepare to preach, that's what I try to say, God, where is it in there? And then as I listen to it, and as you listen to preaching, then we need to understand that's what we're looking for. So with that in mind, let's jump right into the message. The title, as I saw, as you see, there is smoke in the nose of God. That comes from verse number five. Notice what it says, which says, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. Then God says, these are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. God gives some very graphic throughout his word illustrations of how we are, how we act, and then how we affect him and his response. For example, in Proverbs 26, 11, probably every 10-year-old boy's favorite verse, as a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. I mean, you just don't get any more graphic than that. If you have a dog, you know, you say that it's gross, and you've seen him do that, and you say, I, I just can't imagine doing that. Yet God says that's how we are when we go back to our folly. And so we, he gives us that illustration. He gives us another one, Proverbs 30, verse 33. Surely the churning of milk. I think about that. There's probably not, but... A, a few people, maybe only two in this room, that have ever churned milk into butter. I mean, it's a, anybody in here ever churned? 
Okay, one, two, three, all right, there's more. Of course, we're sometimes maybe the older set than that, but we've churned. So it's talking about the churning of milk, turning it to butter, that constant thing. Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth the butter, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. We're talking about punching somebody in the nose. We're talking about getting the fisticuffs. We're talking about responding. He said, just as sure as churning of milk brings butter, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood, so the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. So God gives an illustration about strife and about battles. He's trying to help us understand. He gives us a picture of what we know. And then one that we normally don't hear preached on, but some might say amen to, Proverbs 27, 15, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Whosoever hideth her, hideth the wind. All right, so God gives us a picture. You've got somebody who's constantly nagging and going, nagging. it's just like a constant dripping and you can't hide that. So don't get upset. That probably woke up some folks and that's good, that's good. But so God's just trying to give some illustration to help us say, I get a picture. I understand that. And so God there in verse number five, God gives us an illustration about how he feels about us, how he feels about our actions. He feels about our spirit when our spirit is wrong, when, he, when our rebellion is, is there, when our righteousness is self-righteous. He says there in verse number five, these are a smoke in my nose. Many times you may have been to a fire or a forest fire or back in the day when I was growing up, people burned their trash. Every household, you go out in the backyard and there was a trash barrel and you take your trash out and you'd burn your trash for the day or for the week. It was every young boy's joy when he got mature enough to God, that dad let him go out and say, here, take a match and go burn the, fire, go burn the trash. That was such fun. But you'd come in and you would smell like it. And because that smoke would come up in the nose. And God says, that's what's happened to you. He says, these folks, they're like smoke in my nose. They're irritating. They stink. They, they mess up my taste buds. They're uh, putrid. They make me choke. It's a rancid smell. Wow, God's trying to be very picturesque in how we are when we're wrong to him. Yet... In this passage, when he says, that's how it is, he says, it's like smoke in my nose. Yet at the same time, he shows his grace is ever present. In, sp in spite of the fact that we are like smoke in his nose, in spite of the fact that we are rancid to him many times, he said, yet he loves us, yet he's got a plan for us, yet he wants to restore us and call us back to himself. That's God's amazing grace. He doesn't have amazing grace because we're good. It's his grace is amazing because we're not good. And so God is trying to teach them there that his grace is ever present and ever available for everyone. I'm glad we have God's grace for us. And in this passage, it talks about his amazing grace both for salvation, because we are saved by God's unmerited favor, God's grace toward us. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Moreover, the law, when law entered, Romans 5, 20, that the offense made abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So we find here about the fact that our sin is like smoke in his nose, yet his grace is there to save us in spite of ourselves. It's grace is there for our salvation. It's there for our, in our suffering. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So his grace, in spite of the fact that we're like smoke in his nose, that we're irritating and rancid to him, yet he loves us and his grace is ever present for our, service, for our salvation in suffering. And then tonight we'll see it for our service, for our service. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace, I like that, all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So his grace for service. So we're looking at God's amazing grace. But what makes it amazing is the fact that we're like smoke in his nose, yet he's there to restore us, yet he's there to bring us revival, yet he's there to bring us back. So the goal for this morning is to check out our smell, how we smell to God, and if we are smoking his nose, it will change it from rancid smell to smell like incense, a sweet savor like in sacrifice. 
and then to avail ourselves, even if, is, even if our life is like smoke in his nose, we'll avail ourselves to his amazing grace and then re be restored to him, return to him, repaired to him, revival back to our hearts and life. And so God here is closing out this book of Isaiah. We talked about being smoke in the nose of God and yet God's amazing grace. So let's see the big picture both this morning and this evening about God's grace in spite of our facts, how we are, and recognize it, receive it, and rejoice in the grace of God. Let's get the instruction. Let's get the correction. Let's get ready for the work of God by seeing smoke in the nose of God and God's amazing grace. So are you with me? I hope that you are. Here we go. It's an amazing passage, but we have to study to get this from all the Scripture for us. Very quickly, we see the reminder of grace being offered to a rebellious people. The reminder of God's grace being offered to a rebellious people. Notice what he says in verse number 1. I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that is not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. Wow, what an amazing picture God has for himself. What an amazing thing God says to these people that were like smoke in his nose. Yet he says, Behold me. Behold me. He says, look unto me. He says, you're a rebellious people, but look over here at me. Look unto me. That's why the Bible says, why he says earlier in Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. He says, behold me. Behold me. He says that today to Lighthouse Baptist Church. He says that today to Pleasanton and Livermore, California, and to America, to a nation that's rebellious, to a group of people that don't know him. He says, behold me. Behold me. I'm glad we've got a God that wants us to look to him. That we don't have a God that says, oh, you can't look at me. Stay away from me. He says, behold me. Behold me. Notice what else he says in verse number two. I have stretched out my hands all the day unto rebellious people. He's got his arms out just like a begging father, just like a begging mother, just like somebody wants him to be restored. His arms are outstretched. What an amazing God we have. What an amazing God we serve to this rebellious people that pulls us in and draws us in. I, I can't think of, I don't know of any other gods in all the world, though they are false gods, and he's the only true God, but still that has, that has arms that begs him to come, that desires him. No, the rest of the gods is you serve me. You make sure that you're doing it. I don't want any part. You keep your distance. We have a God that says, please come. But he doesn't have his arms out to his good children. He has his arms out to the rebellious ones. That's even more amazing. It would be one thing. If we, in our goodness, God would say, you're doing a good job. Come, No, his arms are out. He's saying, behold me. He tries to draw us into a rebellious one, to the prodigals. That's why in Jesus' parable about the prodigal son is so evident both in Isaiah 65 and in our lives today. You know the story about the prodigal son that rebelled against his dad, took his inheritance, and went and spent it in riotous and wicked living. And when he had spent all, found himself at the hog pen, decided to go back and be just one of his dad's servants, tell him he's not worthy to be called his son. We know the story Jesus gives, and as the son was coming back, the father was watching, and the father saw his son afar off. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against thee, or sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. In other words, he says, I'm like smoke in your nose. He said, I know I've been wrong. I know I've been wicked. I know it must have hurt you. But the father said unto his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry 
Oh, that's what God is trying to do right there. He says, behold me, behold me. He said, my arms are outstretched all day, all the time. You say, God, say, Pastor, I've been away from God. His arms are outstretched. You say, Pastor, I've never known God. I've never come to him. I'm not saved. I don't know about this thing in heaven and hell, about being born again. His arms are outstretched. What a great God we have. He says, look unto me as to a rebellious people. Behold me, behold me. Let's look very quickly at this rebellious people, and we'll find ourselves either before salvation or unfortunately many times after salvation. We are this rebellious people that God is saying, Behold, reminding us of his grace, reminding of us his love in spite of our sin. Look at the rebellious people. Let's seek some instruction, some correction that God has for us. First of all, we find that this rebellious people, they were like smoke in his nose, they walk in the ways of their own thoughts. They walk in the ways of their own thoughts. Verse number two, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. What kind of people is that, God? Who are these rebellious people? Which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. By the way, when we walk after our own thoughts, it's not a good way almost always. It's a wrong way. But after our own thoughts. We walk, we have a lifestyle after what we think, what my mind thinks, what my heart thinks. That's why Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way, that's what God was talking about this way, which walketh in a way that is not good after their own thoughts. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Boy, there's lots of ways to the human mind, to the mankind, that seems that is a good way. That is a, they say, that's a right way. That seems right. But the ends thereof are the ways of death. There's a lot of people who think their ways are right, but it's taking them right to hell. It's keeping them right, it's taking them right to that place called hell. By the way, we all deserve hell. But see, the world has its own ideas of what's right to keep them out of hell. Well, if what keeps me right out of hell is I'll just be good to the poor. That's a good thing to do. That's a right thing to do. But that thought, that doesn't keep you out of hell. Well, I know what it is. It's just being sincere. No. Maybe my good can outweigh my bad. No. i tell you what seems right. We'll have some ceremony. We'll sprinkle some water on our babies. We'll, we'll make sure that we give certain amounts. We'll go in and we'll have confession and we'll go ahead and do this. We'll go to a certain place, a certain time in my life, and we'll do all those things. Those things seem right, but the end thereof are the ways of death. God says, here's the problem. He says, they're rebellious people. They've rebelled against the truth. They've rebelled against what's so, and they've walked after their own thoughts. There is only one way of salvation, and that's by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not the church, not good works, not our attempts, not our desires, not our sincerity, but what Jesus Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. And when we say, but I've got a thought, I've got a way, it makes no difference. That's the wrong way, that's a poor way, and that is a rebellious way, and that's after our own thoughts. If you think you're on your way to heaven because you've thought it out, well, it's amazing. I've <laughs> when I'm out talking to folks about the Lord, they've got it all figured out. Oh, I've really thought about that, and this is what I think. I said, well, can I show you what God says? No, I'm not interested in what God says. I told you what I think. God says, behold me. Behold me. My arms are outstretched. They walk in ways after their own thoughts. That's for the lost. But it's also for Christians, I'm afraid. We're rebellious people because we walk in ways after our own thoughts. Judges 17.6. Now, before you start thinking about that other person, we have to put our name in there, all right? Are we the rebellious person? Are we walking after our own thoughts? Have we outthought God's word? Have we outthought God's commandment? Have we outthought God's principles? In Judges 17, 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. When we don't make Christ our king, we're in the same boat. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Oh, that's our own thoughts. That's what we think. And God says that's a rebellious people. We rebel because we're walking after our own thoughts, our own ways, what's right in our own eyes. Let's learn to balance every decision and bounce every decision off the Word of God and not what I think. 
I need to know the mind of God. I have the mind of God right here. And so if I'm going to walk in the right way and not a rebellious way, then this is the guidepost for me. This is the instruction for me, not what I think. So I'm walking in the way of God, walking in the way of the Word, and not in my own thoughts, whether it be in how I serve and how I work and how I deal with my family, how I dress, how I sing, what my entertainment, everything about my life. So ladies and gentlemen, we, next time you say, well, that's not what I think. Let's stop thinking about what we think unless what we think is what God thinks. Is that too hard in this Sunday morning? But God's got the way. And so the whole idea of just loose living. People think it's all right to live. No. God says, no, my arms are outstretched to rebellious people that walk in the ways of their own thoughts. Proverbs 21.2 puts a new slant on that. God says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. I mean, <laughs> you just check anybody. No, that's right. I'm I'm doing what I think is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. So man does what's right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth his hearts. We say, I'm right in this, I'm right in this, but in our hearts. See, here's the key. It's not about what is right in honesty. It's about what we want. Are you listening to me? It's let me read it to you again. Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. So many times we'll say, oh, I think this is right. No, it's just what I want to be right. It's what I want in my life. Oh, but see, this, this is the right. No, this is what I want, and I'm hoping it's right. God says, this rebellious people, my arms are open to a rebellious people. Well, what are these rebellious people? They walk in the ways of their own thoughts. Are we getting instruction this morning? Are we getting, is God pointing out some places of reproof? I'm talking about every aspect. I mean, let's just hit every aspect. Those things that the Holy Spirit right now is kind of flicking your heart about. Because you've read it in Scripture, you may have heard it taught, you may have had it preached, you may have been taught to you, and say, I know this is what God says, but I don't think that way. I don't see it that way. Oh, my. God says, you're rebellious people. You're like smoke in my nose. He says, but my arms are out to you but my arm's out to you. Who are these rebellious people? They walk in ways of their own thoughts very quickly. They worship gods of their own choosing. They worship gods of their own choosing. Verse number three, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face. I like that little expression, to my face. In modern vernacular, we'd say, in my face. Did everybody, did you ever tell anybody, get out of my face? Or they come up and says, you're in my face. In other words, you're, I mean, you just can't, you can't be any more confrontational. Now, I know we're living in a in an age right now where we've got six feet social distancing, and it's hard to get in somebody's face. But the idea of getting in their face, I mean, just nose to nose, and you've been there. Moms and dads, you've probably been that way. You've gone up to your kid face to face, even those little three-year-olds, and you get right in their face, and you talk real soft, and you say, are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? You're not going to, oh, that has such an impact. Or somebody's angry and they come right in the face. God says, you're doing this in my face. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to understand when we rebel against God, we're in his face. We're not just over here and hoping God doesn't care. No, we're in his face. But notice what he says. Verse number three, if people that provoke me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifice in gardens, and burneth incense upon the altars of brick, not to God, but to the false gods, to the idols, to the gods of the, of the heathen, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments. In other words, they, they go down to the graves and they, they deal with the dead and they try to use sorcery and they, they talk about the dead and they seek the, the dead for wisdom and eat swine's flesh for the Jews. That's an abomination completely because the Jews were not allowed to even touch the pigs, yet much less eat that, and broth of abominable things in their vessels. In other words, they're worshiping in such things and worshiping in such a way that God said, that is abominable, that's wicked, that's vile. By the way, worshiping other idols is vile. Praying to other people is, God, is vile. But he says they're worshiping gods of their own choosing. Verse number 11. But ye are they that forsake the Lord's, and forgot my holy mountains, and prepare a table for that troop, and furnish drink offering to that number. He says, you're offering offerings to these other people, to these other drink offerings, to the other gods. 
worshiping gods of their choosing. By the way, any God we put before Jesus Christ, anything we put before Jesus Christ is a God to us. And so rebellious persons, we worship the gods of our own choosing. We serve gods other than Jesus Christ. Now, lest we think, well, I'm sitting here watching church. I'm in church. I'm all right. No. I haven't preached on this in a long time, but in 2 Kings 17, verse 33, here's a group of people, a bunch of Jews. They feared the Lord. You said, great, and served their own gods after the manner of the nations which carried them away from thence. In other words, they went to church. They feared God. They took the name, they took the title, but they served gods the way they want, other gods the way they wanted to. I'm afraid that's what we are doing in America. That's what we're doing as God's people. So you trying to get on to us? No, I'm trying to let God show us why we're like smoke in his nose and yet then see his grace toward us. Because if God didn't have grace, he'd pitch us out right now. If God didn't have grace, he'd turn us over right now. But he's dealing with us just like he's dealing with them to restore them back to himself. That's God's grace. Very quickly, notice these are worshiping gods of their own choosing. They had forsaken the true holy God. They had forsaken the true holy God. Notice what it says. As soon as I find it. There it is, verse number 11. But ye are they that forsake the Lord. They forsook him. In other words, they had him, but they left him. They knew him, but they went away. They were with him, but they left him out. They put him away. See, that's what happens when God's people begin to worship other gods. We forsake him. We had him, but then we forsake him. We possessed him, but then we forsake him. They forsook him. They were God's people, but they went after other gods. Romans 1.21 talks about that. It says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And that's what happens to a backslider. We then we know God, we're with God, but then we forsake him. We leave him. We abandon him. I'm begging all of us to be on guard for that, but if you have in your heart or have in your body, let's get back to God. God's amazing grace, but he says, but you're like smoking my nose right now because you're so rebellious. He said, but I'm my arms are out open to you. God's begging us to come back. I'm praying for revival. We're all praying for revival, that God's got his hands open. Let's come back to him. But they forsook the true God. Number two, they had forgotten the holy mountain. They had forgotten the holy mountain. Verse number 11, but ye are they that forsake the Lord and forget my holy mountain. See, you forgot my mountain. You say, what is that? I believe it could be talking about two different mountains. It could be, and this is the least probable, it could be Mount Sinai where the law was given. My holy mountain where I came down and I gave you the instructions and I gave you the law, I gave you my word, but you've forgotten that. You've forgotten how I came down and how you feared and how I communicated my desire and I communicated how to live and I communicated what was right and how to deal with all these issues. They just forgot the law. They forgot the instructions. But I think probably most practically, it's a mountain they've forgotten, is Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, the place of sacrifice, the holy mountain. See, Mount Moriah is the place of Abraham's sacrifice to Isaac, of Isaac. In Genesis 22, 2, he's, God, remember, he tested Abraham, and he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee to the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. It doesn't say it's Mount Moriah, but that's what it sounds like to me. He said, you go down to the land of Moriah, and I'll take you to a mountain, and I'll show you. And he went up to the mountain to sacrifice a picture of God taking his son. And remember, Abraham on the way up, it says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. So they would think about Mount Moriah, and say, oh, they know about Abraham. They know about that, and sacrificing Isaac, and how God chose Abraham to, to be the the first Jew, he said, you forgot my holy mountain of sacrifice where I will provide that sacrifice. That Mount Moriah, the place of sacrifice where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son. That a thousand years later, David offered a sacrifice on the threshing floor of Ornan. You remember when David numbered the people and God was killing the people and God was judging the people and he said, now I want you to go offer a sacrifice 
at that floor at Ornan. Remember what he did? It was on Mount Moriah where he did that. And a few, 70 years after that, Solomon built the temple on that same spot. Listen carefully. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So God, the God tells us where the temple was, where Solomon built the temple, was the place where David offered on the threshing floor, and that's in the Mount Moriah, which is also where God had Abraham go to offer his son's sacrifice. He said, you've forgotten my holy mountain, whether it be the law or whether it be Mount Moriah, where they're talking about sacrifice. By the way, since that's where the temple was, that's where the temple was built, that's also Jerusalem, and also many say is right near, if not the same spot, where Count Mount Calvary is on Mount Moriah, the place of sacrifice. Mount Zion, the place where, he said, you've forgotten about sacrifice. You've forgotten how, what I'm doing. You've forgotten all these sacrifices we've done leading up to the place where we, I'm going to show you this the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. You've forgotten. Oh, a rebellious people. They worship gods of their own choosing. They forsake the true God. They forget the holy mountain, the sacrifice, the law, the instruction, how he meets with them. And very quickly, they furnished other gods. They furnished other gods. Verse 11 but ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forgot my holy mountain, and prepare a table for that troop, and furnish the drink offering unto that, that number. Throughout the world right now, and more and more in our country, we can find places where people set out food offerings for non-living gods. Fruit, water, drink, and that's what they did. They, they, he says, you're serving up, you're furnishing drinks and food offerings for these false gods. Wow. So today, even God's people, I'm afraid, we're furnishing our false gods. We're laying out our possessions, our time, our money, our effort to furnish the false gods whether it be the false gods of sports, the false god of pleasure, the false god of, well, you put it down. We, fall, we furnish our false gods, our money and our time and our energy and our kids. God says you're a rebellious people because you worship gods of your own choosing. You're smoking my nose. He says, but my arms are out open to you. <laughs> He said, anybody that will come, anybody that will turn around, anybody that will come. You say, preacher, I've been furnishing my possessions, my time, my energy to some false god that's not true. God says, my arms are wide open to you. You say, but I've been worshiping the wrong kind of gods. I've been not following them. I've forgotten about the law. I've forgotten about the sacrifice. I've forgotten what God has done for me. He said, my arms are wide open to you. Yes, we may be like smoke in his nose, but his arms are still open. Glory, the grace of God. It's instruction in preparing us for the good works. Not only that, this rebellious people, they not only walk in their own way and worship gods of their own, Listen carefully. Their words boast of their own righteousness. Their words boast of their own righteousness. These people worshiping other gods, forgetting God himself, doing all these wicked things, yet, in verse number 5, which say, well, let's back up. Verse 3 said, this is a people that provoke me to anger continually to my face. They're in my face all the time, he says. And sacrifice in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. He says, you're worshiping the other gods, which remain among the graves. In other words, you're constantly dealing with the dead and lodge in the monuments and eat swine flesh and broth of abominable things in their vessels, which say, so the people that are doing this, this is what they say. Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. Isn't it an amazing thing? Some of the most, you've been there, I've been there. When we're in our most wretched state, we feel the most holy. In our most wretched state, we feel we're still better than somebody else. But notice what he says. These, I believe it's all for those that are rebellious, but he's talking about particularly these that are self-righteous. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. 
self-righteous, I think it's there in your notes, I don't know who said it first, self-righteous, a smoldering heap of rubbish in the nostrils of God. That's why God says even our righteousness was filthy rags in the sight of God. So when we say that I am more holy, when we say I am so holy, whether we're saying it to our neighbors, whether we're saying it to somebody else, or even saying it to God, smoke in my nose. That's so true when we're talking about self-righteousness, about our salvation. See, we always have to go back to salvation, whether we're going to heaven or hell, whether we're saved or not, whether we're God's child or the devil's child, because that's what the book's about. That's why Jesus came, and he wants us to spend eternity with him. But about salvation, there's so many self-righteousness regarding our salvation. Or we think I'm good enough to go to heaven. It's me. I'm trusting my good work. I guarantee. See, all religions are either do this, or in our case, it's already done. It's done by Jesus Christ. But it's that self-righteousness, that building up, I'm good enough, I'm good enough, I'm good enough. Charles Spurgeon, I think the notes are there, I think the quote's there in your nose, he said, your notes, self-righteousness prevents repentance. Isn't that the truth? Why should I repent? Why should I change? Why should I weep? Why should I cry? Why should my heart be broken about my sin? I'm all right. Self-righteousness prevents repentance. You will never believe in Jesus Christ, and I'm assuming he's talking about salvation, while you believe in yourself. See, you can't say, I'm good enough, but I'll take Jesus. Just as many of the folks when my wife was teaching kindergarten in Texas, and many of the other religions had their kids in our Christian school there in kindergarten because it was a good school, good education, and they didn't have any problem with having Jesus as another God. Okay, again, yeah, we can add Jesus to our list of gods. But oh, when it came down, it says, no, there's one. God. There's where the difference was. So it is with our righteous ones. I'm good enough, I'm good, but I'll, I'll be glad to bring Jesus into my life. No. We don't get saved by bringing Jesus into our life. We get saved by casting our soul and our life upon Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross of Calvary. We will not repent. As long as we're believing in ourselves, we can't turn to him. That's why Jesus said, two men went up to a temple to pray. The one a Pharisee very religious man, the other a publican, a very crooked man. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. He said, I'm glad I'm not like them. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes at all I possess. And the publican, the sinner, standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified, saved, in other words, rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You hear this morning, you're not sure you're saved, you must humble yourself. You can't say, I'm good enough or I'm close enough. I just need a little bit of Jesus to get me over the hump. No. God says that smoke in his nose. But see, self-righteousness is not limited to just lost people. Self-righteousness is not limited just to irreligious people. It's the spiritual people, the people who think they're spiritual. Galatians 3, 2. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit, kept less the Holy Spirit, by the law, works of the law. In other words, by what you did, did you get the Holy Spirit? Did you get saved by doing things? Or by the hearing of faith? Or did you hear the truth of faith and hear the gospel and get saved by trusting in Christ? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Because the answer is the only way you get saved is by, by faith. The only by the way you get saved is to get the Spirit is to be born again. He says, so it's not by the works of the law, but the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you are now made perfect by the flesh? Well, when we think we're perfect in our flesh, and we've really done something to change ourselves, he says, you're smoke in my nose. By the way, that self-righteousness of smoke in the nose, that makes us so hateful to other people. That makes us so intolerant of other people. I'm glad God's not intolerant with me. He knows I'm a sinner. He knows I have sinned. But see, when we get self-righteous, we're intolerant of other people. 
I'm not saying we should overlook their sin, we, but we need to be tolerant of them. So when they had continued asking him, they brought this woman, taken in the very act of adultery, and said, the law says she should be stoned. What do you say? But he didn't answer. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, they went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was alone with the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She saith unto him, No man, Lord. And Jesus saith unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Wow. See, they were all self-righteous. What she did was wrong. There's no question about that. Should it be addressed? Of course it needs to be addressed. Of course she needs to be helped. Of course it needs to be identified. But the attitude of this self-righteous and better than thou and intolerance. So the next time you or I get a little hot under the collar, before we gossip, before we cast that first verbal stone, we got to remember how we smell to God. Boy, that's self-righteousness. Not only do their words boast of their own righteousness, but we find their wills refuse Him. God's grace is being offered to a rebellious people, and God's trying to remind them in their wills. They refused Him, verse number 12. Therefore, I number you to the sword. He says judgment's going to come, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but instead, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. They just wouldn't hear. They just willfully said, no, I hear God's calling, but I'm not going to pick it up. It's like you, you go over the phone and see who's calling, you say, I'm not picking that up. By the way, there's nothing wrong with screening. You're not, you don't have to be a slave to your phone. You don't have to do that. I know folks that hear it ding, and boy, they've got to go answer it. What? No. Don't have to do that. But they willingly says, that's God calling. I'm not answering. I'm not listening. I'm going my own way. Smoke in his nose. Whew. What a rebellious people. But God's reminding them about his grace. I'm glad for his grace. So you say, preacher, I've, I've heard myself. I've seen myself. Uh, God has revealed me to him. What do I do? Let's rejoice. Let's recognize and receive God's grace. He's got his arms out hell. Very quickly, notice the remnant delivered in spite of their past. He shows that grace. He says, let me remind you about my grace. He said, you're rebellious people, and I've got my arms out, but you said no. He says, but let me tell you about the remnant. Let me tell you what I want to do. Let me tell you about my grace for a people in spite of their past in spite of their rebellion. Verse number 6, Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, nor will recompense every, even recompense unto their bosom. He says, he says You're, I'm going to have to deal with sin. I'm going to have to deal with rebellion. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills, therefore will I measure their former work unto their bosom. He says, I, he said, I see your past. I see how you've been living. I see what you've been done. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not. For a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake. And I will not destroy all. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah an inheritor of my mountains. And mine elect shall inherit it, and my servant shall dwell there. We find God has a remnant delivered in spite of their past. So who's that remnant? Anybody will come. Verse number 10 is about anybody that seeks him out. Anybody that seeks him out. But there is that remnant. He says, I know your past. I'm going to deal with your former work unless you repent. That's why in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Wow, the remnant. He said, I know I'm got my arms out to rebellious people. And he said, let me tell you about the remnant delivered in spite of your past. Very quickly, we see that God will recompense. God will recompense. God deals with it. That's what he said. He said, I'll do it. He said, I've got to deal with sin. I've got to. I just can't let you keep doing that. I must deal with sin. Isaiah 59, 18, it says, according to their deeds, according, accordingly, he will repay Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. Oh, he says, yes, I will recompense. He said, God will have to deal with it. He said, don't pretend. He said, I can't pretend sin didn't happen. That's why Jesus went to the cross, to allow us to go to heaven. God can't pretend we're not sinners. God can't pretend that our sin is there, or is not there, but it has to be dealt with either under the blood or by our own payment, if you will, in hell. But so he says, let me tell you about this remnant. He says, first of all, he says, I will recompense. He said, I will have to deal with it, but that God does remember his servants. He does remember his servants. Look at the illustration God has. Verse 8, thus saith the Lord. He said, in spite of their former work, in spite of what their bosoms or their hearts are like, thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants, plural, sakes, that I may not destroy them all. The picture he's given there. If somebody's going out to harvest time, gone out to the vineyard, and they're going to get the grapes and make their grape juice, and they take the grapes and they bring them in a cluster, and they look at the cluster and say, Ugh, look at all those bad grapes. There's some mold on those grapes. There's some sour grapes. There's some bad grapes. Yuck. And so you start to destroy them, and somebody says, wait a minute. There's some good ones in there. There's some, get the good ones out of there. Take the good ones out of it. There's some blessings in there. There's some good grapes in there. And that's what God's saying. He says, it's maybe mostly bad. He says, but there's some blessings in it. He said, therefore, just like the, the vineyard keeper would say, no, wait, don't destroy them all. He said, let's get the good ones out. Let's take those other blessings in there. He said, that's what I'm going to do for my servant's sake. That's what I'm doing for my people. I got news for you. I want to be one of the remnant. I want to be some of those good grapes. I want to be some of the blessing. And we all can be. We all are rotten in our case and rotten in our sin. But when we repent and turn back to God, we are a blessing unto God. We are good grapes in again unto him. I want to be some of those good grapes. I want to be that blessing in that cluster. Oh, mostly bad, but God God says, no, he said, there's some good and some blessings I want to be. God will remember those that are his remnant, and he says, for his servant's sake. Now, when I look at that, but I will, so will I do for my servants, plural sakes, it may be because of the servants that he already has saved. Kind of like Abraham pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, I won't destroy all of Sodom and Gomorrah if I can find ten righteous people. He says, man, I won't do it for the servant's sake, for my servant Abraham's sake. He said, I won't do it. He had to go in and get Lot. He said, couldn't find him, but he got Lot and his family out. Or it could be he's anticipating his servants for the servants that are the blessings inside the cluster. He said, for my servant's sake, those blessings inside there. He says, for their sake, I will not destroy it. For their sake, I'm going to pull them out. Boy, you're talking about God's amazing grace. In spite of the past deeds, in spite of the fact they're surrounded by a cluster of rotten grapes, in spite of that, he says, no. He said, there is a remnant. There is a few blessing inside. God will remember his servants. I want to be that blessing in the cluster. You say, preacher, everybody around me seems to be rotten. I want to be the blessing. I want to be the blessing. I want to be some of the good grapes inside this old cluster of bad grapes we've got around us. The remnant delivered in spite of their past. We see God will recompense, but God will remember his servants. That's his grace. And God will bring a redeemer. God will bring the redeemer. Verse number nine. And 
I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob. Oh, we read about who Christ is. You read all the way through. He's the, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of Jacob, the seed of David. He knows that. He said, I will bring a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah an inheritor. We know Jesus Christ is described as the lion out of the tribe of Judah. Oh, he's bringing that redeemer. An inheritor of my mountains. You say, what do you, what do you mean the inheritor? Hebrews 1, 2. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir He's the inheritance, the heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. I believe he's speaking about Jesus Christ. He said, I'm going to bring forth the seed of Jacob out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountain, and mine elect shall inherit it because we are also joint heirs with Christ. He is the inheritor. He inherits it all. But we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So that's what he's speaking about. Us with him shall inherit that same mountain, and my servants shall dwell there with him. I'm glad he's bringing the Redeemer. So he said, he looks at the folks. He says, it's a rebellious people. He says, but, he said, I want you to know that there is a deliverance. There is a remnant. There is a way out. Out of my amazing grace, in spite of their past, in spite of their attitude, in spite of their worship, inside that cluster, there are some folks that will return. There are some folks that will repent. There are some folks that will want me. There are some folks that will walk with God. And he says, I will have to recompense the sin. But at the same time, I remember my servants. I remember the saved. I remember those that are coming. And I'm bringing a Redeemer to save all those that will come. Glory. Smoke in his nose, but praise God for his love and his amazing grace. So the question for us tonight, this morning, even before we get to see the rest of his amazing grace, is where do we stand? How do we smell to God? How do you smell to God? Oh, I'm so good. I'm so good. I'm all right. I don't have anything to confess. I don't have any sins. I don't have any areas to grow. I am all right. I don't need to change a thing. God says, <laughs> oh, that self-righteousness is smoke in the nose. But his grace is available. Let's change it from that rancid smell to the sweet-smelling savor. Then the grace of God. Let's don't frustrate it. Let's receive it. Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Don't frustrate God's grace. Don't frustrate it. Receive it. Recognize it. And repent to the one true God. Get back to him. Verse 1, I, sought, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was caught, not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh not in the way that was good after their own thoughts. How do we smell? Smoke in the nose of God, but God's amazing grace. Let's get back. Don't make him bring recompense. Let him pull you out of that rotten cluster. Let's bow our heads.